So we'll continue our discussion of AC injuries. So, uh, let's see, uh, so type three is where you have a tear of the AC joint ligaments and capsule as well as the CC ligaments, which you can see here. Uh, let's see, Jonah, what do you think of this case? Sure. So it looks like we've got um, left uh, T1 and on the right uh, coronal T2 in the trip, uh, this patient's shoulder. Um, you know, we're seeing some uh, irregularity, of course, of the AC joint. Um, makes sense. Um, now, we might have. Um, so we might have some abnormality of the. Uh... Okay, so so here's the AC joint, and it's widely separated on both the axial and the coronal images. Yep. Axial T1 and yeah. coronal T2. So there's the the separation yep. on the AC joint. <laughs> so what's the next thing you have to do? Well, um, up next, and what I was trying to look for is I want to evaluate the uh, the CC to uh, see if that's. Uh, Intact and oh, nice. Okay, well, that makes it a little bit easier. So, uh, the uh, thoracoclavicular uh, ligament seems to be uh, torn here. So, this upgrades us to grade three. That's a tear. So, so this would be at least a type three lesion. Mm -hmm. And there, there's another image showing the CC ligament uh, acute tear. Uh, and uh, we'll see in a minute where this would be a type three. Uh, but if you have both of those groups torn, they can be type 3, uh, any of the later groups, but this would be a type 3. And uh, typically the separation is about a centimeter in a type 3. Uh, yeah? Or, or the size of the clavicle in diameter. Okay. Would you be able to type uh, the AC separation based on x-rays, like if you you know, you clearly don't have the ligamentous injury that you can see, but you can see sometimes elevation of the, of the distal uh, On x-rays, you can see the separation of the AC joint and any gross bony displacements. And uh, all the, the next types that we see can all be made on, on uh, uh, plain radiographs. But like a three uh, on, but on x-ray would be elevated at the clavicle above the acromion. Not one. necessarily. The type 3, you don't get significant elevation. That's actually a later type that we'll get to in a minute. Uh, so, but uh, now types 1 and 2 are generally widely considered non-surgical. Type 3, there's some debate, but the vast majority of type 3s that I've seen have not gone to surgery. But uh, Campbell, uh, Campbell's does not recommend surgery for type 3. Okay. What, they, what they recommend is... Uh, uh, if the patient has problems down the road, because athletes may have some pain uh, if they're throwing athletes uh, with activity, and so they recommend reconstruction uh, later. Okay. Uh, not, not acutely. I'm not sure I agree with them 100%. I, you yeah. have to kind of leave it to the patient, because a lot of patients will be very unhappy with that deformity. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, most of the papers I've read state that uh, type 3 is borderline, and there may be some of those patients may be surgical candidates, but my experience is that most do not have surgery, at least acutely. Yeah, in old days, we operate on all of them. Yeah, interesting. Uh, well, the, the lawyers kind of made us do it, and uh, I think even today, um, especially in females, you you leave that deformity, you're not going to be a very happy camper. They, they'd rather accept a scar, which isn't bad, uh, than, than uh, that deformity. Pretty ugly, by the way. Well, especially when we get into the type 5. Uh, no, type 3 is ugly. Okay. Uh, well, of course, type 4 and 5 are uglier. Okay. So we got a patient who's been injured while playing uh, at Stanley Cup playoffs. Uh, we got a coronal PD fat set and a coronal T2 image, which shows there is maybe a little mild separation of the AC joint with a lot of edema. The contrast is actually, um, the fluid actually goes extends above the um, superior aspect of the capsule. So there's definitely an AC separation. Yeah. 
Uh, I would like to see the CC ligament. Uh, we have a chrono PD fat set and a T2. I'm oh, sorry, say sagittal. Uh, oh, no, chrono. Okay. Um, so it looks like again there is signal within the in mid substance of the CC going across. So there's a CC torn, <laughs> but there's not much elevation or displacement of the CC interval. Uh, we have another image done the sagittal it just shows that it is torn. So, so this is so a type three. Uh, history of oh. okay. History of the okay. So we have uh, two coronal images that are PD. Well, I guess uh, PD fat set and uh, T two. I think they're both PD fat sets. Okay, both PD fat sets. So there's uh, a lot of edema uh, at the level of the distal uh, clavicle, um, and uh, there's some widening there, and uh, there's edema going beyond the level of the capsule. And then on the more, I suppose, more anterior image, there's this ossific body that's just beneath the skin surface. Um, and there's a lot of edema surrounding it. Okay. So, so, so what do you have here? What, what is this? That's the deltoid. Okay. So we see a forming here. And uh, we're uh, obliquely here. And you can see that there's a fracture here with uh, fluid on either side. And this is a, it was a coracoid fracture with uh, AC separation. Uh, so. Uh, Why is the bone not all the same density? It's just because of the edema well. in it. The, yeah, this is this is has all edema, and that's the fracture line, and this is the edema in the coracoid process. The other bones are all nice and dark, as you would expect with the fat suppressed sequence. Uh, but instead of the CC ligament, the, the CC ligament was injured in this patient as well. But in addition, there was a fracture of the coracoid process. Okay, Jonah, what do you think of this case? All right, here we have an 18-year-old male with shoulder pain after trauma. Uh, so we're Already seeing a lot of uh, signal abnormality around the uh, AC joint. Um, so there's some kind of injury there. Um, oh, interesting. Um, okay, so yeah, we're seeing a lot of um, edema and signal abnormality in the expected area of the acrocrotoid ligament, but we're also seeing this sort of uh, curvilinear uh, structure that uh, seems to be more of uh, a cyphic density. So I would raise concern for an avulsion off of, I guess, the Work with there. Yeah. So, so, so with a type three, uh, usually you'll have a tear of the ligament. In this case, the ligament is also abnormal. Uh, but here are two cases where you actually had bony fractures of the of the coracoid, uh, which also leads to to uh, in instability. So you can have uh, tears of the CC ligaments, or actually bony avulsions or fractures uh, can occur uh, all. Uh, causing the same thing. So those are all would be considered type 3. Then there's a type 4, which is a type 3, but you have a posterior dislocation of the clavicle. And this is kind of what it looks like. The clavicle actually becomes, instead of anterior, it's posteriorly displaced with respect to the uh, to the acromion process. Uh, let's see, uh, let's see. Dan, what do you think of this one? A uh, 28 year old male with shoulder pain two weeks after a motor vehicle accident. We got a coronal T2 and a PD fat set image of the shoulder. Uh, it looks like um, there's a lot of edema at the distal clavicle where the AC joint is. And uh, on this second image on the coronal plane, the distal clavicle is kind of like, it looks like it's been maybe posteriorly displaced. It is not on the same plane. So I would like to see it on maybe axial or another view. So on the axial, looks like a T2 image, TT1, okay. Um, I see the humeral head and glenoid, and then the clavicle, that's the clavicle that looks like it's kind of posteriorly oriented. So then you're, so constellation of this finding of the AC and posterior dislocation, so there's definitely some CC ligament disruption, so it would be a type 4 AC. Instead of being anteriorly positioned, 
over here where you'd expect the AC uh, joint to be, the clavicle is now posteriorly dislocated. And if we go back here, that's actually, this is part of, this is, we're partial voluming part of the cortex of the clavicle. That's not really the distal end of the clavicle. The clavicle is now just pointing posteriorly here. We've got a big space here because it's completely disrupted and dis displaced, and it's displaced posteriorly here. So, and then here are the, of the uh, sagittal images, where we can see a uh, tear of the CC ligament here, and uh, the normal position of the clavicle should be up here anteriorly, but we can see the clavicle is now way back posteriorly here. So this would be a Rockwood type 4, which is an exceedingly uncommon type injury, but uh, it has to be recognized because this is a surgical condition. John? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, almost all type fours uh, are, are operated. Uh, usually, uh, initially, uh, uh, as soon as an operating room is available, uh, unless the patient has other injuries to go with it, uh, because these are uh, pretty high force injuries. Um, most of these occur with falling on a shoulder, so uh, bicycles. Uh, Motorcycles come to mind, and um, there there are several um, major um, type of operations that can be done that are, are used uh, by various individuals. Uh, basically, uh, for, uh, uh, there's some like five types, although there are about uh, 150 or, or 200 different procedures described, but they fall into uh, basically five categories. Uh, uh, first, uh, one way to do it is to, to reduce uh, the, uh, the, the dislocation and transfix it with uh, either K wires or threaded pins and actually actually just fixate the joint, um, usually in a retrograde manner. Some people can use a fluoroscope and do it that way. Um, but I, I used to use threaded pins. Uh, um, most folks recommend that they use uh, smooth pins, but the problem with smooth pins is they migrate and, 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 and some have been reported in the lungs and other places. Uh, the other uh, procedure that can be used, uh, one other type of procedure, is uh, using a Bosworth screw, which entails drilling a hole through the distal clavicle uh, and a hole uh, uh, through the uh, coracoid and then uh, taking a, 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 the Bosworth screw, which has a very wide head, it looks like a button uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a screw, um, and the very wide threads of the screw, and then uh, you, you put that through the clavicle, and you, uh, you, you uh, uh, cinch it down into the hole in the coracoid. So it's, this is a clavicular coracoid type of repair uh, using uh, a screw. Then the other way to do it is using wires, with two different holes in the clavicle, same type of procedure, then using uh, non-absorbable number five sutures. Uh, that's the one I kind of started uh, many years ago. I'm surprised I found it in Campbell's recently. Um, and then uh, my last procedure that I, I, I really uh, liked that I did was a, a absorbable uh, sutures, uh, 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 wide gauge sutures, uh, uh, doing the same thing as the wires, uh, or or, uh, or non-absorbable sutures, and cinch it down uh, to the coracoid uh, process um, after you um, remove all the debris from the AC joint, where there's a lot of debris, especially in older uh, people, and uh, older in this case are over the age of 30 and 35, where degenerative change is already taking place, according to the diplomas. And I'm sure you've seen x-rays and MRIs to that effect. And then uh, there's a, another way to, to do this procedure, uh, a major procedure is uh, more recently described, where you use uh, a, a, a graph, which they call it. Campbell says this is an anatomical um, a repair, you use a um, um, semitendinosis graft or an allograft, and you wind that around the coracoid process, 
and I use uh, interference screws through two holes in a distal clavicle uh, that uh, are hollow, and then you use uh, sutures uh, to go over this, and, and, and it looks like a very uh, cons time-consuming procedure. Uh, and also they recommend removing the distal clavicle, i.e. Uh, they used a uh, um, uh, Mumford procedure type of uh, thing. Uh, now, I, I don't think that that's really necessary. They call this anatomic. I'm not so sure that that's the case. What they do with that uh, semitendinosis, they wrap it around the clavicle and then make a figure of eight uh, out of it so that you, you cross the two ends of the uh, tendon and the uh, graft and then put them through, um, through the two holes in the clavicle and put the interference screws in and tie the sutures together. Um, before you do that, they do a Mumford procedure, makes it easier to visualize the cork. But anyway, you know, that's the latest procedure that uh, uh, Campbell's really likes. I frankly don't think I would use it. It's too cumbersome, I think. It's too much surgery for my liking. The, the, the repairs I've done, and I've done every kind of procedure uh, that I'm pretty much uh, out there, not 150 or 200 of them, but I certainly tried every uh, major technique available in my day, and uh, I finally wound up doing uh, the, the, the absorbable suture technique, which I found uh, very, very uh, 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 very, very good and very easy to do. Great. I'll never forget my mentor, I uh, was a sports medicine guy at UCLA. He called me one day from Curl and Job, where he was for about a year or two before he found his way out of UCLA and uh, went to, to the Valley, uh, where he started at um, Southern California Orthopedic Institute uh, with Fox. Uh, he, he calls me one day from Curl and Job, and he says, John, what's that procedure you used to do for the HD separations? I, he said, what kind of suture do you use? So it was kind of fun to be in the office and have your mentor call you uh, three or four years later to ask me how to do the procedure, uh, which uh, he used to always let me do the ACs stuff because it... Uh, it, 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 especially the left shoulder, because that's harder to do. But anyway, that's that's basically it for AC separations. Um, and um, that the main your thing. Mutus? Can I ask you a question? Um, sure. When you use the absorbable suture, um, how long does it take before it it basically absorbs? And so, how long do you have to immobilize that shoulder so you can get healing? Um, all of the shoulders uh, pretty much have to be. Uh, immobilized for three to six weeks. Okay. Um, after three weeks, you can start using some pendulum exercises and uh, slow uh, motion. Uh, I never use physical therapy. I rarely use physical therapy because I didn't trust it. And I, uh, I was part owner of uh, physical therapy in our building. But anyway, um, so it, it takes six weeks for the um, separation to heal uh, in, in most cases. Uh, I never had a recurrence uh, out of, I don't know, probably done over a, a hundred. Uh, it's a common seat, um, injury I used to see because I we're very close to PCH um, and a lot of motorcycles on PCH. But anyway, uh, you see this in football and all the different sports. Anyway, uh, did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Basically, it's six weeks. Um, that that's the magic. A, a lot of uh, things in orthopedics, you cannot go wrong when you say six weeks. <laughs> okay, so we have a snowboard injury, and we have multiple axial T1 weighted images, and the clavicle is posteriorly and superiorly displaced. Uh, I think superiorly displaced with respect to the chromion um, and then so PD fat saturated images with some edema uh, the distal chromion and sagittal T1 weighted images 
So, is that the clavicle? Yeah, so there's a lot of... Yeah, it's... Yeah, it's posterior, and it's a little superior as well. So then this, would this be a type 5 then? Or still a 4? Okay. It's a posterior dislocation. Posterior displacement of the distal clavicle with respect to the acromion. Okay. Then we can go to type 5, which is really a separated type 2, where you typically tear the superior uh, uh, deep back. Three, three, three. Oh, I'm sorry. Separated type 3. So here we can see that we have tear of the CC and the AC ligaments, and then we have uh, inferiorly displaced uh, 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 chromium process with respect to the clavicle. And then here we can see, now typically, be, you need to be concerned about a, uh, a type 5 if the superior margin of the acromium is inferiorly placed with respect to the inferior margin of the clavicle. That means you have a centimeter or more uh, inter inferior displacement of the acromion with respect to the clavicle. With that, you often will get tearing of these uh, the deep fascia here below the, uh, the muscle, the trapezius muscle in, the, in this location as well. We can see the soft tissue tearing there. And then you have the uh, AC and CC ligament injuries. And this is... Yeah, well, I'm sorry. Well, what happens in this is that... The distal clavicle perforates the trapezius, and uh, you cannot reduce these uh, in any way. Uh, so these uh, are definitely uh, a need surgery. Uh, and of course, vascular uh, concerns are present. So it's, uh, you don't see type fives uh, that often uh, because the, the forces are so great that a lot of people never make it to the emergency room. And so this is, this is from France, where we can see the asymptomatic side on, on our right and the symptomatic right side of the patient here on, on our left, uh, which is inferiorly displaced. And we can see the superior margin of the acromium is below the inferior margin of the clavicle. And on the MR examination, we can see the injury to uh, superiorly here that John was just talking about, CC ligament tear and, and all the, uh, the, the other edema around the area. So this is a typical type 5, and there you can see the tear of the CC ligaments on the sagittal images and the uh, deep fascial tear up here adjacent to the trapezius. And this is on a low field scanner where, again, we can see the same findings of a type 5 lesion. Uh, and this here we can just see examples of the, of the different types, and then we'll come to the type 6 here. So in a type six, whoops, where do I have that? Wait a second. Well, wait a second. I don't have any examples of a type six, but in a type six, the clavicle is inferiorly uh, dislocated, and it, it often will go uh, underneath uh, the short head of the biceps here and be entrapped uh, inferior to the coracoid process, which we can see here. And these require uh, major force. And uh, at this point, I've still not yet seen one on an MR examination. Uh, I've never seen it in practice either. They never make it to the ER. Uh, I don't think that the forces are enormous. Um, OK. OK, uh, let's see. Uh, Jonah, what do you think of this case? Alrighty, so uh, we've got uh, a couple of MR images uh, indicating that we're below the clavicle. Um, now, we are seeing this sort of uh, hypo-intense um, tubular uh, metallic uh, artifact here. So what's so, this um, up here and what's this down here? Okay, so it looks like we're going from uh, the clavicle to the uh, coracoid. Right. Uh, and so uh, this is probably a screw that... Look, um, look, look carefully. So, so, yeah. so, so this is the, the clavicle here, this is the coracoid process there, this is the metal artifact or screw going between them. Mm -hmm. And there on the axial images, we can follow it, the uh, metal artifact down from the, uh, 
from the clavicle down to the corkwood process. And so this was a repair by a large screw. And the problem with these is that uh, there's normal motion between the clavicle and the corkwood process. And over time, these can either loosen or they can, they can fracture. It kind of over constrains the, the joint space there. Uh, that's the Bosworth screw. Yeah. Uh, what, what you actually do is you, you make the uh, hole in the clavicle a li little larger than the one in the, in the coracoid process. And so that it gives uh, room for the uh, clavicle to move a little bit so that it doesn't put stress on a, on a screw. A screw is pretty, pretty um, uh, secure, but if you don't remove it after six weeks, and that's one of the problems with this uh, repair, is uh, that they will break or cut out uh, from the clavicle. So I never liked this screw. I do like this screw to do uh, the Bristol procedure. I love it for the Bristol procedure for, uh, for dislocations of the, the anterior dislocations of the shoulder uh, that I uh, uh, talked about earlier. But for, for the uh, repair of AC joints, I, 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 I don't, I hate it. Because you're, you're, you're basically doing a, a blind procedure. Uh, through a small incision, and uh, a lot of problems can occur doing this that way. And here we can see another example where a screw is going between the clavicle and the core cord process. And uh, here, here we can see the, uh, the the screw fixation hole here in the in the core cord. Uh, there we can see the CC ligament is in is intact. Whoops, wait a second. Uh, this doesn't look like no. a Bosworth screw. I don't know what kind of screw this is. Uh, let's forget this particular case. Let's go on to this one. Okay. Uh, Got a 46-year-old male. Uh, <clears throat> we have a frontal radiograph of the right shoulder and a sagittal uh, T2. Uh, T1, T2, okay. So on the frontal radiograph, it looks like, uh, I'm not sure if the AC joint looks a little, it's okay, but the CC interval is a little elevated, and there is some remodeling of the ossification, the CC ligament, yeah. And the, okay. So this is of the uh, what's, what's interesting about this case um, <laughs> is the fact that there's no AC separation. I don't know whether this patient ever had surgery. It doesn't look like it. And uh, I, I don't know what happened here. Uh, uh, John, do you, do you, do you know? Uh, I don't have any other history from this. I don't know whether this was congenital or whether it's post-traumatic. I'm not sure. I think this is congenital because at this age, 46, you should see AC joint the disease. Well, not disease, but degenerative changes. And you don't see them here. Right. It almost looks like uh, that the AC joint is not almost non-existent. So 58-year-old female with chronic left shoulder pain aggravated by trauma in 2008. So we have a frontal left shoulder radiograph with, uh, there's, so the inferior aspect of the clavicle uh, has a prominent osseous uh, communication with the coracoid. And uh, so then we have a coronal T1 and axial T1 image. Um, at that location, it looks like there's a pseudo-articulation uh, at that location. And on the PD images, PD fat side images, there's edema of the uh, articulation. Uh, so pseudo articulation. Okay. And then now 2010, worsening chronic shoulder pain. So the prior one is on the left in 2006 and then the 2010 study. So, yep. This is actually uh, hypertrophic bone formation where you, as you said, have a pseudoarthrosis uh, arthrosis, uh, uh, 
with a lot of degenerative disease at the pseudoarthrosis. Okay. Uh, Jonah, what do you think? That's our, that's our congenital joint, right? I think this is post-traumatic, John. Um, I, I, uh, I, I know I'm an orthopedic surgeon, but I, I don't. I think this is congenital. You, you may be right. I, I don't. We don't have any imaging before the accident. So. Yeah. I don't, well. Good. We, we won't know, I guess. Yeah. Oops. So uh, let's see. Uh, we got a chrono PD fat set image of the shoulder. I'm not sure if there's a, any arthrogram on board. Yeah. Uh, arthrogram. Um, the superior labrum is intact. Uh, there's a little bit of increased signal, very, very kind of very peripheral edge of it. I'm not sure if that's volume averaging or volume. averaging. And then it's not like tendinosis of the uh, supraspinous insertional fibers. Um, the cartilage looks good. Maybe there's a little bit of thinning or loss at the humeral head. Um, full thickness large, yeah. yeah. And then there's a full thickness. There and loss right, right. Here. so the aper view um, so it's a little bit thin there but you can't really resolve the current mm -hmm. so we have two more images like on is it axial and uh, i'm not sure the image on the right is that what the view is it but basically the uh, card is okay this body but anyway, now that this was a focal defect in the articular cartilage at, at surgery. Okay. Uh, you, uh, John? Yes. Uh, on the last case, uh, do you think that's a tight capsule too? Probably. I'd like, have to look at all the other images though. But it sure doesn't look like much fluid in there. I agree with you. Uh, and, 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 uh, and, uh, Inferior focus uh, is in there, so. Yeah. Okay, so we have a hydrogram study with a coronal T1 fat sat image, and there's a chondral defect of the superior femoral head and the curvilinear loose body in the axillary pouch. It's probably the chondral fragment. Um, okay. okay. Jonah, what do you think of this one? Good. So here we have a 50 year old male with uh, shoulder pain, a T2 uh, coronal, and uh, this PD fat sat. Uh, so, you know, we're kind of immediately drawn to this uh, kind of linear, uh, hypo intense uh, structure just inferior to the femoral head. Um, you know, on, on the topic, this could certainly be a Fragment of articular cartilage, but it's some kind of loose body. A couple more, uh, possibly multiple fragments, then in that case. So, yeah, so that's probably where it uh, came from there. Perhaps it's right there, and you nope, know, it's cartilage. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so why don't we go on and now talk a bit about inflammatory disease of the shoulder? talk about rheumatoid arthritis and talk about bursitis infection and some of the other uh, inflammatory conditions that we can have in the shoulder. Uh, so, Dan, what do you think of this case, normal or abnormal? A uh, 78 year old female with severe chronic shoulder pain. Uh, we got a chrono PD fat set or T1 fat set uh, arthrogram, and then we also have a sagittal, looks like another maybe PD T2. Um, with the arthrogram. So it, there is mark of uh, synovial thickening uh, in the axillary pouch and also in the subacromial. And I'm, I don't know if this patient also has like a full thickness, I mean, I'm uh, sorry, um, rotated cuff tear. There is not like, uh, yeah, because uh, there is, because there's contrast going all the way to the subacromial subdeltoid bursa uh, communicating freely. So for this degree of synovial thickening and um, are you worried about, you know, I guess so inflammatory cartilage. cartilage loss, yeah. So yeah, inflammatory arthritis. Standing rheumatoid arthritis with all the synovial thickening. Hopefully, 
we won't be seeing this in the future with effective therapy for rheumatoid arthritis. Okay. 18-year-old male patient, and we have sagittal uh, T2-weighted images and uh, axial uh, T2-weighted images in the coronal uh, T1 fat saturated image uh, on a patient, I think it says with arthrogram. Um, is this an arthrogram patient or is it just, what? did they have an arthrogram or is that just the degree of joint fluid? Not sure. Um, I think it's an okay, so arthrogram. And so there's extensive distension of the joint capsule with uh, synovial thickening. Um, and then there's some um, erosion on the posterior aspect of the, or yeah, on the posterior aspect of the humeral head. Uh, and then on the, uh, there's a coronal T1 weighted image. That's just a, okay, so significant amount of joint fluid. Yep. And uh, so then on the coronal T1 image, there's a large erosion on the uh, humeral head. Okay, yeah, that makes more sense because now there's diffuse enhancement of the thickened and nodular synovium. So, arthroscopy with synovectomy, is there history? Or, okay. It just shows the, the marked signal thickening of the synovium. And yeah, generally, in this day and age, people don't do synovectomies for rheumatoid arthritis so much anymore. Instead, you really try to treat the uh, the inflammatory condition uh, by uh, uh, medications. Yes. Uh, the, the fellows might uh, look at uh, a Marmer's book that I um, put on uh, on a shelf there. Okay. Uh, uh, about rheumatoid arthritis and synovectomies, I think you might get an interesting mm -hmm. perspective on what we used to do with these. Um, I, I used to do my own cases, not that many, but the guy I worked with uh, did nothing but arthritis. He didn't do trauma. And, uh, his name was uh, Leonard Marmer, and he uh, he was excellent a surgeon, and uh, uh, I used to assist him, and we, we, we would operate on probably four or five cases uh, three days a week or thereabouts, and, and do synovectomies on every joint of the body. Uh, that, that was the only treatment there was available. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, the synovium used to grow back. Yeah. Okay. And here's kind of end stage disease. So this also is a patient with rheumatoid arthritis with a little bit of synovial thickening and effusion. And here we have grade four chondromalacia with a lot of subchondral cystic changes and a bone on bone articulation of the joint. The uh, the articular cartilage is generally not the first thing involved with rheumatoid arthritis, and therefore we have a lot of warning signs to stop the disease now before we ever get to this kind of destructive disease of the articular cartilage, which is what really uh, this and the uh, and the uh, tenosynovitis really affect the function because tenosynovitis produces a lot of pain, and the degenerative joint disease really causes a lot of dysfunction of the joints. So nowadays we can really make the diagnosis much earlier and we'll have a whole talk just on rheumatoid arthritis. And uh, this patient also has uh, swollen nodes down here, which are uh, which we can see here, uh, which are rheumatoid nodules. And on the sagittal images, we can actually see the focal thickening of the synovium uh, much better as well as the rheumatoid nodules. Uh, what I always wondered, and I still do today, uh, Juvenile rheumatoid arthritis occurs uh, quite frequently in only one joint, and there's fever and, uh, and uh, swelling and effusion, etc., and synovitis, of course. And, um, and, and but rheumatoid arthritis uh, almost never affects uh, one joint in adults. So I wonder if these are really two different diseases. Um, I, I don't know, John. I, I just always wondered that about it. Yeah, I don't know. That's a it's a good question. I, I, I'm taking care of a lot of folks, and I, I I've always wondered why in the heck it was only one joint. Yep. And and it was exactly like rheumatoid arthritis, except 
it, it burned out. That was the end of it with the yeah. uh, JRA. Uh, with adults, it would come back and go, and then you know, right, come and go. So it's, I think they're two different diseases. It well, be it would make sense. Okay, uh, Jonah, what do you think of this case? All righty. So we've got a 49-year-old male, um, seven and three years after a surfing injury. Uh, you know, we are seeing some irregularity of a superstitious there, but I think we're also seeing a joint fusion and some debris. Um, well, especially in here, they had a intermediate signal on front of the area too, perhaps. So, okay. so, mm -hmm. so, what do you think is going on here? Well, um, you know, I, I might be a little bit biased. <laughs> topic at hand, but it looks like uh, they did have uh, an acute injury of the uh, rotator cuff at one point. Well, that, uh, looks like you have a traction injury here, which we talked about, which we see quite commonly, rotator mm -hmm. cuff disease. But down here, as what you see here is a lot of synovial thickening here, uh, inferiorly. And if you look at this, this, this fluid is not normal either here. And we can see some signal, lower signal within the cartilage here, so, I mean, within the fluid here. So this really looks like synovial thickening. So as soon as you see that, you've got to be thinking about an inflammatory process in synovitis. Here are the axial images. Well, okay, now we definitely want to think about that inflammatory process. We're seeing marked uh, synovial thickening, actually some nodularity there. Um, yeah, and so marginal, uh, mar marginal erosions here. Uh, probably um, so this disease. And then here again, we can see all this synovial thickening. And this was a patient who uh, was a younger younger guy who had uh, this all turned out to be rheumatoid arthritis, uh, an early adult form. Okay. We got a adult with long standing shoulder pain. We got a two axial looks like T two images of fat set, uh, or actually it's T two. Uh, we have uh, a lot of like periartic, yeah, yeah, pretty fat set, pretty fat set. So we have again synovial thickening, some cortical erosions. Um, it's pretty marked erosions actually of the humeral head and synovial thickening again. We worried about inflammatory arthritis. So you have coronal T1 and T2 images at the level of the AC joint, and uh, there's uh, a lot of edema um, adjacent to the distal clavicle, uh, extending into the subacromial subdeltoid bursa, um, with some also extending into the soft tissue sup more superiorly, some degenerative changes of the acromioclavicular joint. This is really a classic subacromial What? Yeah, so, and the differential here would be infection, uh, gout, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, and psoriatic, psoriatic arthritis would be the more, most common ones. Uh, you can probably get it from overuse as well. Okay. Uh, Jonah, what do you think of this one? 34-year-old female with increasing pain uh, seven months after uh, rotator cuff repair. I guess they're concerned for infection. Um, now, okay, so we do see uh, evidence of repair, repair, but we see um, large joint effusion and a lot of synovial thickening, um, perhaps some erosion, although some of that's uh, post-operative as well. Um, so I think this picture looks more like an inflammatory arthropathy. We're not seeing a lot of soft tissue uh, or anything like that to go with it, so inflammatory rather than infectious. So this this turned out to be someone who had rheumatoid arthritis and and had surgery, and the patient also developed a recurrent tear. But uh, but this uh, the primary they thought the primary cause of the symptoms here was the rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, uh, Dan. Uh, we got a chronic shoulder pain. Uh, we got looks like two chrono images of the chest, uh, just kind of like or more posterior aspect of the shoulder. Um, there is 
Mark, I think it's like edema between the ribs and, um, I mean, it's like extra pleural space um, and between the shoulder blade uh, with some, I guess, subchondral abrenation of the uh, scapular, like, you know, spine. Oh, well, that's like a, well, that's a scapula, uh, the body of the scapula, I'm guessing, or just, and there's a lot of edema deep to it, deep to that. So you have scapular thoracic bursitis. bursitis. What is this structure here? Yeah, scapular thoracic bursa is pretty, uh, pretty large, and and they're not unfrequently involved in in in, in pain and and what you see here. I've taken care of my share of these patients. I've, I've usually, no, oh. usually in females. I don't know why. Well, the, the scapula, as you know, should be a very thin bone here. And this middle, middle age females. Yep. And this is a large osteochondroma. And it's sticking right into the area of the scapulothoracic uh, joint space, producing a mechanical irritation of the bursa there, producing bursitis. So when you have osteochondroma in the wrong places, it can produce a lot of problems. Okay. A 33 year old male with four weeks of pain after a flu shot that went into the bone. That's unfortunate. So we have uh, coronal and axial uh, PD fat saturated images, and there's uh, a lot of edema um, within the humeral head posteriorly. Uh, on the sagittal T1 weighted images, uh, there's a little bit of low signal um, corresponding to the extensive edema. I don't see a tract going from the soft tissues to that bone. Um, and this case, they never grew out an organism, but this was presumed to be osteomyelitis. Oh, the, the, the track could be a, it's so small you can't see it. Um. Right. So, uh, and I, I don't, I don't think it's. Well, they they probably uh, stuck the needle into the bone and injected. I don't think that 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 would just produce enough inflammatory response on its own. So they they presumed that this was osteomyelitis and it seemed to resolve on antibiotics. But they never had an organism. Jonah, what do you think of this case? Sure. So we've got a 19-year-old female with uh, some shoulder pain after a fall. Um, got a couple radiographs of her shoulder. Um, AC joint looks pretty good, but uh, what we're seeing of the uh, proximal uh, humerus, uh, there's this uh, kind of round uh, or kidney bean-shaped uh, lucency with uh, minimal sclerosis of the uh, surrounding uh, tissue. Oh, okay. There it is on MR. Um, so yeah, we're seeing um, sort of intermediate high intensity uh, T2 and then sort of high intensity the other uh, sequence. Um, then we're seeing some uh, reaction of the uh, adjacent um, osseous structures. Um, this doesn't seem like it would be related to a fall. It almost looks like um, you know, it would be more of an infectious process and this could be well, abscess. Yeah, if this were an abscess in this location, a 19-year-old, what do we typically call these? Uh, then it would be called uh, Brody's abscess. Uh, that's, uh, right. yeah. You can see some cr chronic scleronic reactive change here. These are chronic lesions, and this mm -hmm. is a typical Brody's abscess, and they typically occur in the metaphyses. Uh, and yeah, so this... Uh, that, I, I suppose uh, a fall could activate it. I don't know. It's, it's, uh, but these these can stay around for years and asymptomatic, and then they'll just kind of spontaneously I've, become. I've seen them and I drilled them, and I, yeah. you're, you're 100 percent right. But uh, sometimes people uh, get an uh, injury, and, uh, yeah. and uh, it makes you wonder sometimes if the trauma can kind of uh, irritate things and start the pain, and they won't go away. Then you have to take care of it. Um, was that the number one thing on our differential with the history of fall, or did we just, did they have symptoms of yeah. infection? Or? The situation, this does not look like a, a typical fracture. Uh, around a structure like this, with this kind of a 
bone edema. Just looking at this, uh, my my first thought would always be a Brody's abscess in a 19-year-old. <laughs> I don't think this is trauma. You could be concerned well, about some sort of a lytic yes, uh, I mean, like a, mass. A, a yeah, okay. you certainly, and that's one of the reasons I got the MR scan after they did that. Uh, and this really uh, looks now like a Brody's abscess. These kind of thickened, indistinct margins, the, the kind of dirty fluid that you see in it. Uh, I don't even think you'd need to give contrast, but you could give contrast and you'd find that this would not enhance internally and you'd have some peripheral enhancement around it. Uh, do you know if they needled it? I, I don't know the treatment, but I'm sure, well, almost always, if you suspect Brody's abscess, the treatment is to drain it. So, uh, so sometimes you just treat it with antibiotics, but it tends to be an area where antibiotics don't diffuse in very well. So most of the ones I know of, well, actually, to be honest with you, about half of them that I'm, I've followed in the past have been treated with antibiotics alone, though I think the general recommendation is to, is to drain these. Yeah, when, uh, all, uh, all abscesses need to be drained because the antibiotics cannot get to them. Right. They're, 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 they're walled off from, from circulation. Yeah. So you, you have to drain them. Yeah, they'll tend to come uh, back. And I used to say years and years ago, the surgeon's finest hour is to drain an abscess. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. patients are so happy. Yeah. I see. Got a six year old female with fever and shoulder pain for one week. Uh, it looks like we have three chronal images of the shoulder. T1. T1. So it looks like a heterogeneously iso intense and I mean iso to T1 and hyper intense on T2. Um, of the shoulder muscle, like actually, I think is the uh, is that uh, it's too posterior to deltoid. deltoid. Yeah, so I'm worried about myositis or um, like abscess. Sixty-two-year-old male with shoulder pain for ten days. So you've uh, coronal T1 and uh, PD fat sat and post contrast. Images in fairly chronal, and uh, uh, it's sagittal maybe. Is this on the, the, oh, the this bottom is one. Sagittal. Yeah, sagittal. So there's a uh, enhancement of the muscle peripherally of the supraspinatus, um, which demonstrates high PD signal intensity. Um, well, there may be a little bit of enhancement here, but the bulk of the yeah. Well, there's peripheral enhancement, and uh, it looks like there's a fluid collection with that peripheral enhancement inside the muscle belly of the supraspinatus. So, okay, so the main thing is this huge fluid collection inside the muscle belly, right? Hmm? Yep. And then you can see maybe a little bit of enhancement surrounding it, right? Yep, so there's an abscess in the muscle. And on ultrasound, there's this heterogeneous uh, echogenic structure in the supraspinatus muscle consistent with it. Plus. Oh, it's a it's in the bursitis. It's a bursitis. Oh, no, sorry. It's, it's infection of the muscle in the bursa. Okay. Uh, Jonah, what do you think of this case? All right. So here we have a uh, patient with some shoulder pain. Um, got a couple of chronal images, uh, T2 and PD fat sat. So it looks like we've got a tear of the uh, supraspinatus, um, full thickness with some retraction, a little bit of. Okay. See a little bit of so, fluid. Yeah, yep, a little fluid around there. So what did they do? Well, it looks like they uh, went in and uh, repaired it, um, but now they're having new pain, huh? Yep. Um, okay, well, we're seeing a lot of edema along the, um, the repair, but I see some tendon kind of intact, but we're seeing some soft tissue swelling and um, so penis edema, a lot of edema kind of and also of the bone as well, and even a little kind of irregularity of the cortex there. And you see the bus was torn here with a big defect. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's, there's, that a failure of, there's a failure that of, of, mm -hmm. the, of the repair, and we're seeing a lot of edema in around the suture anchors. Yeah, we are. Be concerned that this yeah. infected. Yeah. And this is all infected, and one of the problems after infection is often the 
the surgical uh, construct will break down due to the infection. And so this was a re-tear with an infection in this area, which is a, a bit of a, an issue for the orthopedic surgeon. John? Uh, well, you have to remove uh, uh, the screws and uh, or the anchors um, and debris the area and put the um, irrigation system in and IV antibiotics after you get a culture. Well, you stop them before you get a culture, but you can get a gram stain and then a culture and uh, immediately start antibiotics. Uh, yep. A broad spectrum IV. And usually it's a six week IV treatment uh, or, or more. Yep. With a big pick line, which you guys put in. We got arm pain developed after surgery. Uh, looks like we have a frontal radiograph of the left shoulder who, for this patient who has had um, total shoulder arthroplasty and refractures. And then we have CT images with, I guess, arthrogram. I'm guessing those, no, is that, or just, no, arthrogram. So this is a CT image that shows that all these uh, hyperdense uh, uh, lesions uh, in this uh, antibiotic beads. Yes. <laughs> so this was a that they got infected. Oh, so they removed it then, and they, they just. They uh, IV antibiotics, and then they put in these beads that have an uh, uh, antibiotic that slowly leaches out over uh, many weeks. So that's another treatment for uh, infections. So weightlifter with severe pain after water skiing. So we have a frontal radiograph and, which demonstrates some lucency at the distal clavicle. Um, yeah, that's which, probably okay. Okay. We don't see the soft tissues real well. There's not a good soft tissue clinic. Okay. And then they put in steroid injections to, to help the shoulder pain. And then this is the MR scan that was finally done. Okay, so after steroid injections, we have uh, coronal T1, or uh, coronal T2, and, and a stir. PD fats and a stir. Um, so there's this band of low signal intensity adjacent to the biceps tendon with uh, superficial extensive edema within the subdeltoid bursa uh, and uh, fluid more anteriorly adjacent to the, the, the uh, biceps tendon. So with the injection of a steroid, I know that um, sometimes you can have, uh, or you, or that like, it could be infected, whatever material was injected. So um, or it could go directly into the bursa and soft tissues. So this was called a rotator cuff tear. Okay. At this time. And they thought that the fluid in the, the subacrum of subdeltoid bursa was due to the rotator cuff tear. And here are the sagittal images. Uh, okay. All the fluid in the bursa. And if you look at the rotator cuff, there's a little bit of signal intensity in it, but if you actually look, the fibers were grossly intact, though maybe you could say there's a super, a bursal side partial tear, uh, but this is actually infection in the supraspinatus tendon. Uh, the patient started uh, losing mental status, developed a high fever, was sent into the hospital, and uh, this ended up all being staph aureus arthritis and septicemia. Uh, actually... What happened is the patient was was oops was doing very poorly. They asked us to review the MRs. Uh, we were concerned about infection, and then they called back to say that the, the patient actually had a very high fever. So they took him to the hospital, and uh, he actually was admitted into the uh, intensive care unit. And then uh, this is three weeks later. Uh, okay, so three weeks later, I have coronal images, uh, T2. Oh, no, that's a T1. It's a T, T1 P, yeah, T1 and PD fat set. So there's a persistent. So now there's edema uh, within the uh, humeral head 
um, where the supraspinatus tendon attaches. And there's also uh, irregular uh, edema surrounding the, within, again, within the subacromial subdeltoid bursa, but it's less pronounced than it was before. Um, so it's still, so they have persistent increasing pain. And so these low signal intensity foci within the fluid. Um, so if they had an aspiration, did they have the fluid removed? So if you had an aspiration or surgery, you can see where you can get air in it, which did not occur here. So once you see uh, air like this in the soft tissues in this setting, you've got to really be concerned about not staph aureus, but uh, anaerobic uh, infection. And the patient... Yeah. And uh, here, these are all gas in, in the soft tissues here. And uh, uh, this ended up being... I don't, I don't remember whether it's clostridia or not, but he ended up having a mixed infection. And at this stage, he was treated for the staph aureus, which is what they found to begin with. I don't know how they did the cultures, but the cultures just grew out staph aureus the first time. But now uh, he was readmitted to the hospital uh, with an anaerobic infection, which we could see by the MR examination. Uh, so, so this is what infection can look like in this particular case. Uh, and I think the steroid injections probably didn't help. Yes, go ahead, John. Uh, the, the patient survived, you know? This patient did survive. Uh, oh, that's good. Uh, finally, and, and was asymptomatic, and the, the family called and let me know that he was doing fine eventually. Well, why don't we stop here, and we'll uh, pick up the torch uh, tomorrow. And... Uh, I don't know, we, maybe we'll be able to finish uh, the shoulder section uh, tomorrow, but we'll do masses at the end of the year. So. How about Monday, not tomorrow, John? Oh, uh, Monday, yes. Thank you, John. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, you, uh, I think you need the weekend. Yes, sir. we certainly do. We're ready for it.